In the history of World War II, 1940 was a year of dramatic change. At the outset, people watched and waited to see what Adolf Hitler would do next. But for the Allies, as the Führer employed his blitzkrieg tactics across Europe, swallowing up the Low Countries and France into his ever-expanding Nazi empire, it was too late to stop him. Next, Hitler turned his attention towards Britain. And as summer turned to autumn, the island nation quite literally had to fight for its survival. As everyone looked skyward, the Battle of Britain raged overhead until Hitler was finally forced to face defeat, at which point London bore the brunt of his anger. The Blitz saw Londoners relentlessly bombed night after night at the mercy of Hermann Goering's Luftwaffe. But the spirit of Great Britain now under the premiership of Winston Churchill, never faltered. With autumn giving way to winter, as you'll discover in Fighting Further Afield, the British not only held their ground on the home front, but were soon making headway in North Africa. And while Hitler's Italian ally, Benito Mussolini, edged his troops into Egypt, it was the Axis who suddenly found they had a fight on their hands. As countries around the globe began taking sides in the conflict, what began as a European war showed every sign of becoming truly global. While Japan joined forces with the Nazis, the Americans began sending aid to the British and took precautions to defend their country. In the meantime, the unlikely pact between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, forged at the beginning of the war, was under threat. And before the year was out, Adolf Hitler was preparing for a course of action that was destined to shock the world. By the beginning of October 1940, the boundaries of nations across Europe had changed dramatically. Before the war had even started, Czechoslovakia had effectively ceased to exist with much of its territory carved up between Germany, Hungary and Poland, while the Western powers, continuing their policy of appeasement, did nothing. It would soon become difficult to ignore the threat that Nazi Germany posed, however, and when Adolf Hitler ordered the invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939, within two days, Great Britain and France were drawn into a war which would last for six long years. Although the period leading up to the spring of 1940 was relatively uneventful for the Allies, by April, Hitler's gaze had shifted west and the continent was soon engulfed in turmoil. On April the 9th, waves of Nazi paratroopers descended into Denmark and Norway, and just one month later, the Germans crushed the Low Countries of Belgium and the Netherlands. Then, in a stunning blitzkrieg attack, in which the famous Nazi general Erwin Rommel played a major role, Hitler's panzer divisions swept across France to the English Channel, destroying everything in their path. The British expeditionary force and the French troops fighting in Belgium and northern France found themselves trapped on the beaches of Normandy. But when the German panzers halted unexpectedly, it allowed the evacuation of nearly 340,000 Allied soldiers, ending on June the 4th, 1940. The miracle of Dunkirk allowed those fighting the forces of the Third Reich a moment to rejoice, but when the Nazis marched unhindered into Paris, there was little left to celebrate. On June the 22nd, in the Compen Forest, France signed an armistice with Germany in the same railway carriage where the Germans had surrendered to the French at the end of the First World War. Britain was now alone 
in the battle against the Axis. As Adolf Hitler began preparations for the invasion of the British Isles, the valiant pilots of the Royal Air Force fought night and day to defend their country against the Luftwaffe. Having seen what the Nazis had achieved in the rest of Europe, people around the country were now preparing for the worst. But as the words of Winston Churchill, we shall never surrender, resounded across the nation, the British continued to battle throughout the summer of 1940. By mid-September, Adolf Hitler realised that the invasion of the country, codenamed Operation Sea Lion, would have to be postponed, and that Germany had lost the Battle of Britain. Although the Nazis would continue to bombard Britain's towns and cities during the Blitz, by the autumn of 1940, with most of Europe occupied by the troops of the Third Reich, Hitler had other matters to preoccupy him. He was keen to begin working on the ideologies he described in his autobiography, Mein Kampf. This would draw his attention to the East, where, in his opinion, the two greatest evils in the world resided, the Communists and the Jews. In Mein Kampf, he'd made no secret of his hatred of Jews, and as early as 1922, he confessed, Once I really am in power, my first and foremost task will be the annihilation of the Jews. By the beginning of October, it was clear that Hitler's determination to carry out earlier threats had not wavered. And in Poland, a country with the largest Jewish population in Europe, the horror of the Nazi master plan could not have been more evident. Prior to mass deportation to concentration camps, the Jews were collected into ghettos in the cities. And on October the 3rd, 1940, Warsaw's Jews were instructed to move into what would become the biggest ghetto of all. It held 380,000 people, amounting to 30% of the entire population of the city, crowded into only 2.5% of the land area. By November the 15th, it was cordoned off from the rest of the city, and the people crowded within were left to face disease and starvation. Those who were lucky enough to survive the ghettos faced an even worse fate and were deported to death camps. Although the public perception of the Holocaust is Hitler's attempt to eradicate the Jews, many other groups were also targeted. It was decided at a conference in Berlin to expel 30,000 gypsies from Germany and send them to occupied Poland. Here they would be put into death camps such as Auschwitz, where they were cordoned off from the other prisoners. Heinrich Himmler, the chief of the Gestapo, took charge of their deportations and executions. And it's estimated that up to half a million gypsies were killed during the war, which was almost the entire gypsy population of Eastern Europe. In the Nazi concentration camps, prisoners would be given symbols to wear, which showed their status within the prisoner hierarchy, depending on race or religion, among many other factors. The gypsies were branded with black triangles and held the lowest status in the camps, along with the Jews, who had the identifying symbol of the star. People were also targeted depending on their political allegiances, and communists were especially hated by Hitler and identified by a red triangle. Hitler's experiences of the First World War shaped his attitude to many of the groups who would suffer when he came to power. In Hitler's opinion, the First World War had not been lost by Germany's inability to fight on, 
but by intentional sabotage of the war effort by Jews, socialists and Bolsheviks. In 1917, revolution had torn through the Russian Empire while the First World War was still raging and a communist leader, Vladimir Lenin, had taken center stage advocating equality and universal brotherhood. When the Tsar was overthrown, however, the country became divided in a bloody civil war, which brought death and suffering to millions of people. There was a genuine fear in Germany that the Bolshevik revolution would spread further afield. In fact, by early 1919, it was evident that communist ideologies had crept into Germany when two attempted communist revolutions took place in Berlin and Munich. Both were brutally crushed, mainly by the Freikorp, a paramilitary group of returned war veterans who hated the communists. Many of these men would go on to become senior figures in the Nazi party, and indeed one of the main reasons for the existence of the Nazi party was to fight communism. In Hitler's Mein Kampf, he made no secret of his hatred of the Soviet Union considered the Soviet subhuman and ruled by Jewish Bolsheviks and saw a war on their nation as an unavoidable part of his master plan. Unlike the Nazis, the communists believed in a universal brotherhood and equality, and to Hitler, their destruction would be inescapable on the path to world domination. It was therefore surprising to say the least, when in late August 1939, the Nazis and Soviets signed a 10-year non-aggression pact, commonly called the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, after the foreign ministers of the two countries. The agreement renounced warfare between the two countries and pledged neutrality by either party if the other were attacked by a third party. Each signatory promised not to join any grouping of powers that was directly or indirectly aimed at the other party. When the Soviet press broke news of the pact, it was met with utter shock worldwide. But it was only a ruse by Hitler, and it would not be long before he attacked his old ideological enemy. By mid-August, Hitler had already began discussing the prospect of taking on the Bolshevik menace with his military commanders, and he would soon begin putting pressure on countries around Eastern Europe to join the Axis so he could expand his resources and prepare for a full-scale war to the East. In the meantime, in October 1940, he focused on cementing relationships with countries around Western Europe. While the British continued to fight back and refused to surrender to Nazi Germany, Hitler's aim was to create a continental block of powers, leaving the island isolated from the rest of Europe. The Italian dictator Benito Mussolini had already joined the Axis, signing the tripartite pact with Germany and Japan in September 1940, though he had begun collaborating with Hitler long before. The British owned valuable territory in North and East Africa. And while the Battle of Britain was in full throes, Mussolini, encouraged by Hitler, had begun edging his troops into Sudan, Kenya and British Somaliland to the east, and the British protectorate of Egypt to the north. The Suez Canal in Egypt was of particular importance to the Axis, as this was the pathway to the rich oil fields of the Middle East. To seize these would increase Axis oil supplies considerably, and even more importantly, cut off fuel supplies from the Allies. Not only this, but the Suez was also vitally important to Axis domination in the Mediterranean Sea, an area that still had a strong Allied presence. On September the 9th, 1940, the Italian 10th Army had launched their offensive on Egypt, succeeded in pushing the British back beyond the village of Sidi Barani to the east of the Libyan border. Here, the Italian commander, Marshal Rodolfo Graziani, dug in and established several fortified camps just 80 miles west of the British defences at Mersa Matru. But when Mussolini pressurised Graziani to press on, he refused, 
waiting to be resupplied, and here the Italians would stay until December of 1940. While the Suez, for the time being, remained in British hands, there was another strategic point in the Mediterranean that Hitler was keen to seize from the Allies, namely the island of Gibraltar, which lay between North Africa and Spain. In order to send troops onto the island, Hitler was well aware he would first have to gain the support of the Spanish dictator, General Francisco Franco, so Nazi forces could launch their attack from the Spanish coast. With high hopes, the Nazi leader travelled to Hende on the French border to discuss the matter with the fascist leader on October the 23rd, 1940. During the Spanish Civil War, which began in 1936, both Italy and Germany had provided Franco with aid, sending planes to bomb cities fighting for the Republican cause. The German Condor League and the Italian Air Force had attacked Barcelona and the town of Guernica in the Basque region. But although Franco had happily accepted assistance from the Nazis in the past, he was uneasy about inviting the Germans to camp on his doorstep. When he met Hitler, he produced a long list of conditions for participation, including a claim on Gibraltar, territory in Portugal, and Vichy French territory in North Africa. While Hitler hoped to consolidate relations with Vichy France, he had no choice but to refuse the Spanish leader. Nevertheless, Spain's supposed neutrality in the Second World War would not stop the country from providing the Axis with aid. The Spanish helped build observation posts around Gibraltar for German spies, and allowed German U-boats to be resupplied at their ports, and Italian bombers to refuel at their airfields. Members of the Spanish Embassy in London even collected intelligence information for Berlin. Meanwhile, Hitler would be considerably more successful in forging an alliance with the French Prime Minister, Marshal Philippe Pétain, who he met on October the 24th, just one day after his meeting with Franco. Pétain had been a successful military leader in the First Great War, and after an impressive victory in the Battle of Verdun, he had become a public hero and was made a Marshal of France. But though Pétain was held in high regard by statesmen both at home and abroad, by 1940, public perception of him would change dramatically. As the Nazis marched into Paris, the French Prime Minister Paul Reynau had refused to surrender to Germany, and when he was forced to resign, Marshal Pétain took his place as head of state. It was Pétain who would sign the armistice with Germany on June the 22nd, 1940, which gave the Nazis control over the north and west of the country, including the entire Atlantic coastline. A new administrative centre was set up in the spa town of Vichy. While Pétain tried to gain favour with the Nazis by accommodation and collaboration, both occupied and unoccupied France would suffer. Pétain blamed France's liberal democracy for the defeat of the country and set up a more authoritarian regime, changing the motto of the French Republic from liberty, equality and fraternity to work, family and fatherland and introduced many harsh measures to the country, including anti-Semitic laws. Six days after the secret meeting with Adolf Hitler, on October the 30th, the French would realize the extent to which their new leader had betrayed them, as Pétain declared in a radio broadcast speech, I enter today into the way of collaboration. It was clear that his alliance with Nazi Germany had been sealed. But although Hitler was now assured of the allegiance of Vichy France, old allies were threatening to undermine his plans for the Eastern Front. In preparation for the invasion of the Soviet Union, 
the German dictator had made moves to secure Balkan territory to the south of the Soviet border, where he hoped to create a waiting zone for his troops. On October the 12th, Nazi soldiers were moved into Romania to secure the precious Ploiesti oil fields, which would be a valuable source of fuel for the Nazi war machine. It was a step too far for Hitler's Axis partner Mussolini, however, who deemed Romania as being within his sphere of influence. The fascist leader was infuriated when he heard the news and felt even more sidelined on hearing of Hitler's talks with Vichy France in late October. Increasingly frustrated with Germany's failure to consult Italy on military moves, he announced, Hitler always gives me a fait accompli. This time I am going to pay him back in his own coin. He will find out from the papers that I have occupied Greece. Greece lay to the southern extreme of the Balkan Peninsula. And while British ships anchored in its ports and used the country to refuel, its collaboration with the Allies concerned Mussolini for some time. Keen to prove that he was on his way to creating a new empire on the scale of the Third Reich, Mussolini decided that now was the moment to strike. Without consulting Hitler, on the eve of October the 28th, the Italian leader sent his ambassador into Athens with an ultimatum to the Greek government, allow free passage for Italian troops into Greece or face war. The Greeks had a good relationship with the British, and their king, George II, was an ardent Anglophile, keen to keep close ties with the country. Hardly surprising, then, that when faced with Mussolini's ultimatum, the Greek response was, then it is war. The next day, Italian forces crossed the Albanian border, assured by military leaders that the Greco-Italian war would last no more than two weeks but the Greeks would not yield easily, and Italy would soon be retreating back into its Axis territory. Meanwhile, as war tore through the peninsula, Hitler's hopes of ensuring that the Balkans remained a quiet waiting area before he attacked the Soviet Union had been dashed. While events unfolded on the continent, across the Atlantic Ocean, the United States of America was keeping a close eye on European affairs. In 1940, it was election year, and President Roosevelt was attempting on the one hand to play down the possibility of America joining the war, and on the other, quietly trying to aid the Allies. In the interwar years, the American people were very hesitant to involve themselves in another distant war, having lost many young men in World War I. Nevertheless, while the Nazis continued to bombard Great Britain, Winston Churchill had sent delegates to America to plead for help, and Roosevelt felt compelled to assist those fighting the Axis. On September the 3rd, 1940, Congress agreed to amend the Neutrality Act to allow munition sales to the British and French. Fifty overage destroyers were sent to Britain in exchange for bases in the Atlantic and Caribbean, marking the beginning of America's moves towards belligerency. In another bold move on September the 14th, Congress passed the Selective Training and Service Act of 1940, which required young men to register with local draft boards. This was the first peacetime conscription in United States history, and by October the 16th, as the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, drew the first draft capsule while the nation looked on, draft registration had begun. The first number drawn by the Secretary of War is serial number 158. Thousands of men would now be called into the military services, but as young draftees fought mock battles with make-believe weapons, the United States was not prepared to fight in a full-scale war just yet.
Meanwhile, Roosevelt had a difficult tightrope to walk, with a presidential election due at the end of the year. Though there were those who supported intervention, many more supported isolation from the war. And if the president wanted to keep the public happy, he would have to find a way to please both parties. Roosevelt had not been eager to continue to a third presidency. He had had two exhausting terms, fighting the Great Depression in the 1930s, and was now keen to retire. However, with war on the horizon, his conscience would not let him leave the political arena, and it was evident that the Americans were not willing to part with their president just yet. However, in the weeks running up to the election, Roosevelt would face a tough battle against his competitor, the Republican Party candidate, Wendell Wilkie. Wilkie was a corporate lawyer and a former Democrat who'd never run for public office before. However, he was ready to put up a fierce fight for his place in the White House. A big focus of his criticism was Roosevelt's attempt to break the two-term tradition as president, established by George Washington. And he declared, if one man is indispensable, then none of us is free. The issue failed to catch the public's attention, however. And as Republican support dwindled, he turned to criticism of Roosevelt's interventionist behavior. Wilkie claimed that Roosevelt was secretly planning to take the USA into the European war against Germany and stated that no man had the right to use the great powers of the presidency to lead the people indirectly into war. His promise to keep our boys out of foreign wars is no better than his promise to balance the budget. They're already almost on the transport. While the accusations flowed and support for the Republicans grew, Roosevelt defended himself admirably and stressed that his intention was to do all he could to keep America out of the war. In the northeastern states, he repeated daily the message, I am fighting to keep our people out of foreign wars and I will keep on fighting. He declared, I have said this before, but I shall say it again and again and again. Your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. But Roosevelt need not have feared that the public would let him down. And when he received 27 million votes to Wilkie's 22 million on election day, it was clear he had won over the Americans once more. On November the 5th, 1940, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was duly elected president for an unprecedented third term. Whether he would keep his country out of the war as promised, however, remained to be seen. The news that Roosevelt would remain in the White House for a third term was met with relief by the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who feared that without American support, the fight against the Axis would be difficult, if not impossible, to win. While bombs continued to rain down on the British, the Blitz was not the only cause for concern for Churchill, as the Battle of the Atlantic, which had begun when Britain declared war on Germany in September of 39, was taking its toll on Allied merchant shipping. Britain was an island nation with an overseas empire, and its survival and ability to fight depended greatly on supplies from across the Atlantic Ocean. And as more boats were lost at sea, goods arriving in the country were rapidly depleting. Items that had always been taken for granted suddenly began to disappear from the shelves. And as early as January 1940, food rationing had to be introduced so everyone could claim their fair share of what was available. Bacon, butter and sugar were the first to be limited. But it wasn't long before many other things, such as tea and meat, were added to the list. And soon it was commonplace to see people queuing up outside the shops, brandishing their ration books.
Food wasn't the only thing to be rationed, however, and with limited amounts of fuel, petrol had been the first item introduced for rationing back in 1939. Although fuel production continued in Britain throughout the war, much of it was reserved for the army's trucks and tanks, as well as the planes of the RAF. Bombers travelled long distances to Axis territory and needed a huge amount of fuel. So, with petrol in short supply, people were encouraged to use public transport rather than their own cars, and seeing horse-drawn vehicles rattling through the streets became a familiar sight. Some, however, preferred using a more inspired method of getting about, and gas bags were occasionally used to supply cars with fuel. The fall of France in June 1940 had exacerbated the problem of getting supplies to the British Isles. With France beneath Nazi occupation, the German U-boats had direct access to the Atlantic from the western French ports of Brest and La Rochelle. This placed them a great deal closer to the convoy routes than normal and effectively doubled their range and patrol times. Worse still, France had the fourth largest navy in the world, and with Patan now collaborating with the Axis, the Allies no longer had this valuable naval force at their disposal. Meanwhile, the battles in Western Europe over the spring and summer of 1940 had taken their toll on British shipping. Six destroyers were lost at the Battle of Dunkirk, a further ten were lost in the Channel and the North Sea between May and July, and the Norwegian campaign had claimed six. The fighting in Norway had ended just two weeks before the fall of France on June 10, 1940, and now freed up the U-boats that had been occupied with the Scandinavian battle. From this moment on, Atlantic U-boat patrols swarmed into the Atlantic from the north, while there were few Allied ships available to protect the convoys, the period from June to October 1940 was coined Happy Time by the German Navy. Using wolf pack tactics and launching operations from French bases, over 270 Allied ships were sunk during this time. Meanwhile, U-boat crews became heroes at home, and the most successful captains became celebrity aces. These include Gunther Prien, who'd famously sunk the Royal Oak at Scapa Flow in 1939, and sank over 30 Allied ships during the war. Commander Otto Kretschmer, who was regarded as the most successful ace of the deep, and Joachim Schepke, who was much admired for his unwavering dedication to the Nazi cause. Meanwhile, as convoys battled their way across the Atlantic to keep Britain supplied, the Mediterranean Sea, which had been a traditional focus of British maritime power, was also under pressure from the Axis. With Mussolini's troops now pressing into Egypt, it was vital to get supplies to the troops defending Allied territory. But while the Italians were conveniently supplied from the Italian mainland, British stocks had to travel the length of the Mediterranean all the way from the island of Gibraltar. This evidently put the Italian Navy in a strong position to cut off supplies to Allied troops, and British commanders were keen to resolve the problem. Back in 1935, when Mussolini had set his sights on creating a new Roman Empire and had marched his troops into Abyssinia in Africa, British military strategists had begun examining the possibility of an attack on the Italian naval base at Taranto. Later, during the Munich Crisis of 38, 
when Hitler threatened to seize Czechoslovakia and the world had waited with bated breath to see if war would be declared, preparations for an attack on the Italian Navy had gathered pace. Admiral Sir Dudley Pound, then commander of the Royal Navy's Mediterranean fleet, was particularly concerned about the Italian naval presence in the Mediterranean and planned an attack which would eventually become known as Operation Judgment. Although the offensive had been postponed when Neville Chamberlain, then Prime Minister, appeared to have averted war with Germany, by 1940 preparations for the Taranto attack were once more underway. And by the autumn of 1940, when General Graziani brought his troops to a halt at Sidi Barani and British ships were freed up for action, the Allies seized the opportunity to strike. On November the 11th, RAF reconnaissance flights confirmed that the Italian fleet was in harbour and brought back photographs of the ship's positions for intelligence officers based on the carrier HMS Illustrious. By 9pm that night, the first wave of 12 swordfish biplanes were launched from the Illustrious and a second wave of nine followed an hour and a half later. Carrying a mixture of torpedoes and bombs, the aircraft succeeded in knocking out half the Italian battleship fleet in one night. There was also extensive damage to the docks and facilities and the next day, licking their wounds, the Italian Navy decided to transfer those ships that had survived the bombardment to the port of Naples. In the meantime, the Royal Navy had greatly increased its control of the Mediterranean. It was the first all-aircraft naval attack in history and would mark the beginning of the end for the battleship and the rise of naval air power. While the Second World War would eventually be drawn to fierce battles in the Pacific, this would increasingly be proven to be the case. The attack on Taranto was also groundbreaking for another reason. It had proven that air-launched torpedo attacks did not require deep water as previously thought. And far away to the east, another Axis partner of Nazi Germany, the Empire of Japan, had watched the dramatic events at Taranto with great interest. Japan, like Britain, depended on supplies from overseas. And while the West, in particular America, condemned the country's war with China, the Japanese feared interference with their plans to build their own empire. The Japanese Admiral Yamamoto was particularly impressed by the offensive and saw that if there was no option but to eventually fight America, they could cripple the US naval fleet before it left for eastern waters. The Taranto bombing would thus become the blueprint for Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941. Meanwhile, back in Britain, the success of the Taranto attack was a much needed morale booster as the Luftwaffe's terror bombing maintained pressure on the population. The Blitz, which had started early in September 1940, continued unabated and life was far from easy for those who continued to struggle on the home front. The man determined to use air attacks to crush British morale was Field Marshal Hermann Göring, who was second in command to Adolf Hitler and the highest ranking officer in Germany. As a veteran of the First World War and one of the earliest members of the Nazi party, Göring had formed a close friendship with Hitler and was appointed commander of the Luftwaffe in 1935. With aircraft boasting the latest military developments, there was no doubt that the Luftwaffe was one of the most powerful air forces on the globe by the outbreak of the Second World War. And convinced of its superiority, the Field Marshal had proudly announced, if an enemy bomber reaches the Ruhr, my name is not Hermann Goering. 
but by the autumn of 1940, while the RAF battled to defend their country against invasion, it was clear that the Luftwaffe would have to accept their first defeat in the Battle of Britain. Göring was eager to maintain some of his prestige, and proving that the Luftwaffe were a force to be reckoned with began a terrifying aerial bombardment of the country. The first phase of the Blitz from September to October 1940 focused on subduing the British capital, with massive bombardments on London both night and day. But by November of 40, the Blitz had taken on a new form, and one raid in particular could only be described as a personal attack of revenge. While the Luftwaffe targeted Britain, the RAF had also begun to do its fair share of damage, attacking towns and cities around Germany. But on November the 8th, they went one step too far, as far as Adolf Hitler was concerned. The Nazi leader was enjoying an annual celebration of his 1923 attempted coup in Munich, known as the Beer Hall Putsch, when the gathering was suddenly interrupted by an RAF bombing raid. The Führer was incensed determined that an attack on the capital of the Nazi movement would not go unpunished. He ordered Goering to launch Operation Moonlight Sonata. On the night of the 14th of November, almost 500 German bombers swarmed over the city of Coventry in the industrial heartland of Great Britain. Before its inhabitants were aware of the terrible fate that awaited them, Thousands of incendiary bombs were unleashed on the streets below. Wave after wave of aircraft indiscriminately dropped their lethal payloads on the city in relays until Coventry was completely engulfed in flames. In 10 hours, from 7.20 in the evening until dawn, almost 150,000 incendiary bombs and 500 tons of high explosives were released. And by the morning, the scene was one of utter devastation. Transport systems and gas and water mains had been destroyed and more than 60,000 buildings had been obliterated. Unlike most British towns and cities, there had been almost no development in Coventry and much of the medieval city had been standing at the time of the raid, only to be flattened in one terrible night. There was barely one undamaged building left in the once beautiful city centre and even the 15th century St. Michael's Cathedral had been destroyed. As a cloak of smoke and drizzle hung over the city, the next day people wandered about dazed, taking in the tragic scene of destruction, which was all that remained of their city. Meanwhile, as the rest of the country awoke to hear the terrible news, within hours of the all clear, the British Home Secretary, Herbert Morrison, arrived and was soon joined by King George VI, who made an unannounced visit to give moral support to the destitute citizens. 
The biggest tragedy of all was the loss of life, with initial reports suggesting that up to 1,000 people had died, 400 so badly burned that they could not be identified. Hundreds of women and children were among them, and as more bodies were pulled from the rubble, by the 20th of November, the first mass burial took place, to be followed by another one week later. While the people of Britain mourned their loss, further afield, hope lay on the horizon. Following the Italian advance in North Africa, General Archibald Wavell, the commander of the Middle East Command, had ordered preparations for a British counter-attack, and the period of relative inactivity in the region was about to come to an end. On the 7th of December 1940, the commander of the Western Desert Force, Lieutenant General Richard O'Connor, was ordered to commence Operation Compass and attack the Italians based at Sidi Barani. One of the weaknesses of the Italian defences around the village was that their forces were split up among several fortified camps in the vast desert, spaced widely apart in a chain. This meant that on December the 8th, British troops could pass unnoticed through a gap in the chain attacking from the rear, take one camp after the other. On December the 10th, Allied forces were in position, blocking the south and southwestern exits to Sidi Barani. But after launching an attack on the Axis troops, by the evening of the 11th, all resistance had ceased and the Italians had surrendered. From here, O'Connor's troops would go on to take Solom, Halfaya and Fort Capuzzo in Libya. By the 15th of December, all Italian forces had been pushed out of Egypt or were prisoners. It was a black moment for Mussolini, not least because the Battle of Greece was faring little better. And not only had the Italians been pushed out of Greek territory, but by mid-December, a quarter of Italian-occupied Albania was under Greek control. Hitler, meanwhile, had little time to concern himself with Mussolini's disastrous attempts at expanding the Italian Empire and was busy setting in motion his plans for the Eastern Front and strengthening control of the Balkans. The regent of Hungary, Miklas Horthy, had entered into negotiations with Hitler as early as 1938. And while the communists loomed close to the border of his country, he saw the Nazis as the lesser of two evils. On November the 20th, 1940, Horthy committed his alliance to the Axis to print and signed the Tripartite Pact. Just three days later, on November the 23rd, Romania followed suit and then Slovakia. Now, with these three nations all firmly beneath his sphere of influence, Hitler had created a northern Balkan tier along Russia's southern flank. Within weeks, ignoring all attempts by his most high-ranking officers to dissuade him, the Nazi leader confirmed his plans to invade the Soviet Union, codenamed Operation Barbarossa, and a date for the invasion was set for May the 15th. 1941. As Hitler moved inexorably towards a showdown with his nemesis the Soviet Union and 1940 drew to a close, on the 29th of December President Roosevelt delivered one of his famous fireside chats to the American public. The speech marked a definite decline in the isolationist policy of the United States. It seemed that American intervention was approaching ever closer. 
While more nations had been drawn to the side of the Axis, Roosevelt warned the Americans of the risks that the tripartite pact posed, describing it as an unholy alliance of power to dominate and to enslave the human race. He warned of the Japanese threat growing in the Pacific, the evils of Nazism and Adolf Hitler, and reminded his citizens that the British and their allies fighting across the Atlantic were still desperate for aid. We must be the great arsenal of democracy, Roosevelt stated. For us, this is an emergency as serious as war itself. Meanwhile, even as Roosevelt spoke, the bombs were raining down on the British capital once more, in the most devastating air raid on London to date. It was only four days after Christmas, and Germany had commenced their bombardment with renewed enthusiasm, creating a vast firestorm which would be called the Second Great Fire of London. Around 1,500 fires were started, covering an area from Islington in the north to St. Paul's Churchyard, and the cathedral itself was only saved thanks to the dedication of volunteer fire watchers. In the midst of all the destruction, Vital water mains were shattered, so firefighters had to combat the mud and slime of the Thames River to feed their hoses. The Nazis had chosen a night when the river was at its lowest ebb on record, making the task even harder. Although the all-clear siren sounded by midnight, the battle had only just begun for the London Fire Brigade, have to struggle for another 15 hours to subdue the flames tearing through the city. While the capital of Great Britain was engulfed in turmoil, there was no doubt that the battle against the Axis was far from over. But the new year promised many changes in the theatre of conflict, though the struggle on the home front and overseas would continue for a long time yet, the events of 1941 would bring hope to those still fighting Adolf Hitler. <laughs>